The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to the manager, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that, when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe the master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. The manager said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended him for the dis- His master commended him for the because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, our wisdom, our treasure. Amen. The lost sheep was a lot easier. This moment in our worship each Sunday, the moment of the sermon, it's a little bit like going to an appointment. The appointment is already set between the word of God coming to you through the scriptures and you, the people of God, arriving here to hear it. And who is the doctor in this appointment? It's the Holy Spirit. That's the one who speaks God's healing, transforming word to your hearts and minds. And the role of the minister, the minister is like the instruments through which that healing might arrive, but it's never the minister. It's only the Holy Spirit that can speak to your hearts in the ways that are for you through the scriptures. And so today, as that instrument, I want to be transparent with you that I am challenged to preach on this parable before us from the Gospel of Luke. Honestly, I'm not quite sure how best to interpret it faithfully and I wouldn't take it as a moral example. At least you and I are all in good company that plenty of ministers, preachers, and Christians have felt confused about the message of this parable where a dishonest manager does even more dishonest deals to make friends with the boss's debtors, and yet, despite the crookedness, is somehow part of the message that Jesus shares with us. So what could be the lesson here? The different English translations of the story in different versions of the Bible put their own spin on what the lesson might be. So take, for instance, verse 8. It's the one that I stumbled over where I lost my place in reading. Verse 8, it's kind of the crux of the story. This is where the boss discovers that the manager has cut all these debtors a deal. And what does he do? The boss isn't upset. He's impressed, even pleased. 
and commends the manager because he acted. He acted, well, how did he act? In Greek, the word is phronimos. Phronimos. And that's where every English translation finds a different way to translate it. So in our translation from the New Revised Standard Version today, it's shrewd. Shrewd is often acting resourceful. You're in a tight spot, and you make the most of your opportunities that you have. You play your cards just right. You're being shrewd. Maybe you're even bending the rules a little. But in some translations, there's other ways of putting this parable. There's a more positive spin in some, especially Catholic versions, where, where the, manager, the boss says to the manager, you have done wisely. And then there's other versions that say, you were dishonest, but well done, you were prudent. And so, having to choose with something to go with, I'm going to offer today for us, and hopefully it will be a word for you, the word prudence. And prudence, honestly, has kind of a mix of positive and negative associations. It's maybe not a word you use every day. If you remember, as I do, comedians in the 1990s, Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, when the first George Bush was president, Dana Carvey would famously do an impression. Not gonna happen, not at this juncture, wouldn't be prudent. And that might be one occasion that you've heard the word in popular culture. But you see the word also in the loop when you're driving, if you're in the passenger seat and you can look up, there's the prudential building. Prudence is often a virtue now used in financial talk, that what is the decision that will make the most money on the investment and not expose us to risk, not expose us to loss? That's being prudent. So the sense of prudent that we get now, even though formerly it was a more expansive virtue, is often about saving yourself, getting the most you can get, saving your money to save yourself. And maybe now you can see where I'm going with prudence. It does bring us back to Jesus' words, which are going to take prudence and the mix of associations we have with it about being risk-averse and do something with it, transform it, change it, so that the end goal won't be putting money at the center of everything, but prudence will mean something richer, but still practical, still important. So for you, the people of God coming to hear the scriptures, the word of God coming to you, the appointments here, the instrument is this preacher, and the word is prudence. The word could be transformed into a Christ-formed practical wisdom, a Christ-formed prudence. And practical wisdom, practical wisdom is something that's at the center of who you are. You can know a lot of facts and information. You can access a lot of data online and know where to find it. You can know a lot of vocabulary to analyze the world, the right-isms, the wrong-isms. You can know the words about racism, injustice, sexism. But how do you actually use data? And how do you actually use those analytical words in any specific situation? That's practical wisdom. That's living ethically, where there isn't a guide to tell you what to do. You have to know what rules might apply, but also trust yourself and the wisdom you've gained over your life through experiences. And this is practical wisdom at the core of who you are. And one word for it is prudence. So where this came up recently was confirmation lessons, and it was in the part about the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments, we can know what they are. We can remember them like facts. But how do you actually use them how do they guide you in a specific, complex situation? You can know what they are. and see if you can do it with me. I might lose my place. You shall not worship any other gods. You shall not use the name of your Lord God in vain. You shall honor the Sabbath. You shall honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And last two, you shall not covet other people's possessions. The Ten Commandments. We can know them as guidelines for our life. And in confirmation, all of us Lutherans learn them. But how do you actually live them day to day in incredibly complex situations where we start off in a world where all the commandments have already been broken, 
and we have already broken them in our hearts. Others we are dealing with, maybe breaking some and not others. And sometimes we might even take some of them and think, how do I live this faithfully? And we'll even find that they seem to contradict each other. So that sometimes not bearing false witness, saying the truth, and seeming to love someone can be a hard one to balance. How do you live your job faithfully in a corporation where you bring what you learn from confirmation and your Lutheran upbringing, your Christian discipleship, and the corporation has already given itself over to the worship of money, and you know that, but how do you do the best with what you have? How do we do the best as neighbors in communities, in a city, in a country where you shall not steal? It was broken long ago in the bodies of Africans black people brought here for money. And although that's long ago, the effects go on across generations, and we still live with that today. So that then, don't murder, don't steal, in certain neighborhoods, it's already in the background of all kinds of commandments that have long been broken. What is the best practical wisdom to live faithfully, to live prudently, to live wisely? What's the right thing? at the core of yourself, to do what honors God's word with the life you have, with the purpose, action, calling, job, family, situation that you have. And that brings us back to the parable. The good news in the parable is this, I think, one way to look at it, possibly. The manager who's caught up in his own dishonesty, the manager who's caught, the manager who's broken the commandments, He's about to lose everything and about to lose his job. And what's left? What can he do with what he's got? How can he make the best of this situation? Live faithfully. What's the practical wisdom for the manager? One option would be hanging on to the rules to the very end. But this parable, I don't think, is a moral example for us to follow because as the manager cuts deals with all the debtors, there's a twist. And the twist is, the boss isn't upset, the boss is impressed, the boss commends the phronomos, the prudence, the wisdom of the manager. And actually, we can take this parable to say, the real boss isn't, isn't the corporate boss, isn't the boss, the landlord boss, isn't the boss who owns all the property. The real boss in the parable, take off the mask, it's God, it's God who sees acts of mercy, who sees acts of complex, hard decisions, but you follow the call of Christ to love your neighbor, to do what is right, even if it might not be risk-averse, always, and find the right balance, as this manager did. And I think the parable takes us out of the situation and back to God. So it's God who says, well done. Well done to be merciful. The God whose wisdom lives in our hearts, after all, who's at the core of our being, the the one who gives us practical wisdom to follow the commandments, to live by their guidance, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not not self-interest, ultimately. It's not greed. It's not the worship of money. The God whose wisdom shapes our hearts and guide our actions is Christ. Christ on the cross. The one who doesn't judge judge prudently to save himself, but gives his life for you and me, for all of us sinners, this whole broken world and all its broken promises, and gives us the wisdom we need where we are at today. Amen.